Hi, my name is Joe Seacrest, and I'm the president of the Purple Martin Conservation Association. I'm really thrilled that uh, you guys are here for the second keynote of the conference. And what I'm going to be talking about is uncovering the mystery of Purple Martin migration. And that's exactly what it was until very recently. Um, the, the entire overwintering uh, ecology of Purple Martins was very, very poorly known. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of why that's important and how we came to know what we know now. So uh, buckle up and here we go. So quick primer for, for those of you who uh, may not know Purple Martins very well, but uh, I'll go through it pretty quickly because uh, I think just about every talk has some of this in there. Um, but Purple Martins are North America's largest swallows. Uh, males uh, that are two years old or older uh, I have that dark blue coloration. They're not purple martins after all. They're blue martins. Uh, Portuguese gets it correct. They call them blue swallows. I don't really know where the purple part came from, uh, but technically their feathers are actually black. It's a structural coloration in the feather. Uh, it's actually uh, the, the, the way that the feather is constructed that uh, refracts and reflects the light uh, to give you that blue iridescence. And sunlight and uh, younger males and females all have uh, a lighter coloration on their undersides uh, to to different degrees but uh, uh, the, they're named mostly for the uh, adult male coloration they uh, have three subspecies um, we're going to be talking primarily about our understanding of uh, that in the east progny subus subus um, that's the large lavender bit on the map there east of the Rockies all the way down to the Gulf all the way north to uh, the forests in Canada um, this uh, is 98 percent the, the vast majority of all purple martins are that eastern subspecies um, at, there are two subspecies out west with much much smaller uh, population sizes and different nesting uh, habitats um, that being the forested northwest uh, nesting in uh, woodpecker snags and um, uh, woodpecker holes uh, in the southwest, the desert southwest, and, and saguaro cactuses. But those in the east, where the majority of purple martins are, um, those are entirely reliant on humans for providing nesting habitat uh, due to a combination of habitat loss and invasive species. So why do we even care? Uh, aside from the uh, basic importance of, of each and every species, uh, these birds eat 262 billion insects every year, a quarter of a trillion insects, many of which are pests to humans, agricultural pests, uh, bugs that uh, we'd rather not have a whole lot of. So um, they're an important part of food chain, controlling flying insects, and uh, one of our other talks uh, during this conference is about our efforts to um, determine the exact diet of purple martins through looking at DNA and, and their uh, droppings. So, uh, but at any, any rate, uh, it's a really important species to have, um, aside from you know their, their inherent importance and, and uh, natural beauty. Uh, they're something that we want to keep around. But unfortunately, uh, according to the Breeding Bird Survey, uh, over the last 50 years or so, we've lost 8.87% uh, uh, of the total population each year. So compounding, that's the equivalent of a loss of a third of all purple martins uh, compared to where the population was uh, 50 years ago. So significant population declines. Um, this, it, it's easy to, to dismiss um, the population's declines, uh, population declines of purple martins as just the result of their housing crisis, um, the fact that they need uh, humans to provide housing. But the population decline that they're uh, enduring is echoed by other aerial insectivore species as well. So there's something much wider going on here, and we can't just simply attribute it to that fact. And we know that it's not a simple a simple mechanism that's going on here. Um, this is also from the breeding bird survey. Areas in red uh, have had a 
over 1.5% decrease each year over the last 50 years. So that's like twice as, as bad as the overall average that I just previously gave you. But you can have those areas in red right next to an area in blue, which is a 1.5% increase every year. So incredibly complex what's going on here. Um, you know, just leading us to, uh, to know that there's a lot we don't know. Um, and this species being, you know, so reliant in the East on human provided housing makes it an excellent study species for research, uh, to better understand it. And, um, I would say we, we have a pretty good understanding of purple Martin ecology, uh, in the breeding range, but they're migratory species. They, they spend the majority of the year away from the breeding range. Um, I'm going to go into how we, you know, went from not knowing that to knowing that, but the importance of us understanding the rest of the year for a purple Martin is, is how we understand all the factors that are affecting their population levels, whether increasing or decreasing and overall they're in a decrease. So just, just uh, to, to put it simply, we lack a thorough understanding of what happens to purple martins away from their breeding grounds. We just don't know. But before we get into the purple martin thing, I thought it would be fun to take a little step back into just how people uh, became, you know, gathered an understanding of bird migration in general and how that then developed into research methods to study it. So way, way, way back, 350 BC, a guy who goes by the name of Aristotle, um, he noticed that the common red start, which is on the left there, it was around and then it wasn't around. And at that point, the European robin, which is on the right, tended to appear. So his theory was that one species was changing to the other species and then back when the next part of the year came around. I mean, you can see how he would think that, right? Uh, we already know just from watching our bird feeders that, you know, birds change their plumage throughout the year, right? Goldfinches bright and yellow in the summer. During the winter, they get kind of a drab color, right? So you can see how we would think, okay, this one's changing to this and then it's changing back. Um, even though, you know, the habits and, and, and the body shape and everything are a little different too. A reasonable, you know, theory for what's going on. Uh, I would say things took a, a little bit of a turn away from, uh, uh, you know, reasonable theory. Uh, once we got to about the 1500s, um, Swedish Archbishop Olus Magnus, uh, he wrote a book uh, and there was uh, an etching in it um, that depicted these guys here fishing, right? They're pulling up a fishing net out of a pond or lake. And if you look really close, you'll see that it's not fish in that net. It's actually birds. Uh, what looks like fish stacked on top of fish is the bird and then its wing is what looks like kind of another fish on top of it. But uh, that was the theory at the time as well, that um, birds in the winter, they sank down to the bottom of ponds and lakes, overwintered in the mud, which, uh, you know, I guess you can see how they got there. You know, some of our other talks uh, during the conference have been about purple martin roosts. And along with the roosts, uh, you know, you find out that they have an affinity for uh, being around water during their roosting times. And the roosting time is right before they migrate south. So the last time you see them before they disappear for the winter, they're around ponds and lakes. And, you know, maybe they noticed that. Then they noticed they were gone. Maybe they found some dead ones floating in the water or sunk down to the bottom of the pond. Maybe that's where they got that theory from. But at any rate, that was kind of a theory. Uh, you know, I feel like it was in the wrong direction of uh, accuracy. But uh, then in the 1800s, 1822, there was the discovery of the Feilstorch. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's in German. I should think back to my high school German, but uh, translates to arrow stork. Um, and it was, uh, this one was, is actually a stuffed, uh, the stuffed first Feilstorch. Um, and it was discovered in Germany in 1822. It's a white stork that uh, was seen flying around. I don't know if it died or if somebody captured it or what. Uh, but it had this uh, arrow in its neck that it had flown there with, you know, while it was in there. And when they finally tracked down where this arrow was from, I mean, they could tell that it wasn't European. It was uh, from Africa. And that was really kind of the first 
marked or banded bird was this file storage. It was a bird that we had proof that that same exact bird was in Africa and then it was in Germany. Before, you know, even in the 1800s, people were traveling a little farther and there was a little uh, faster long distance communication. So, you know, you could have people saying, okay, we've got white storks here and your white storks are gone and you got white storks and ours are gone. You know, they must be moving. But this is the first time that you really had a bird that you could say this one went here. You know, who's to say that those two populations in Germany and and uh, Africa weren't like going east and west somewhere else, you know, or whatever, whatever they were doing. Um, the file storage is really the first banded bird. And there's actually been 25 file storages uh, discovered in, in Germany that were shot with arrows and survived and, and made the migration back north. But really, uh, bird banding is, 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 is where things led to. Um, PMCA utilizes bird banding. It's actually really kind of the most important basic part of a uh, ornithologist toolkit. Um, you know, we've banded over 22,000 purple martins. Um, many more of that have been banded elsewhere. Um, any bird we get our hands on, we band. Um, and it's, it's really, you know, once you're able to take a flock of birds and you give an identity to one of them, so when you see it somewhere else, you know it's that same one. When you find it dead, you know it was that one. You know, if you see it somewhere else, you know it was that one that went somewhere else, right? Um, you can do research at that point. Uh, you, you can study the individual, which is, is an important step in, in research. And th that got organized in 1902. That's when kind of scientific bird banding began in the U.S., um, organized by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, uh, Department of uh, the Interior, I think. I don't know. Um, but at any rate, uh, over the last 120 years, um, actually, this number is a little low. Okay, I need to update this slide. But over half a million Purple Martins banded during that time. So five, you know, as of a couple of years ago when I made this slide, 539,139 bird, uh, Purple Martins were banded. And in that time, the number of banned encounters outside of the U.S. and Canada, anybody care to hazard a guess? Put it in the chat now if you have a guess. Tick-tock, tick-tock. The answer, 39. Only 39 over out of half a million. So we're talking 0. 0.000 something percent, right? Tiny fraction of a percent. So bird banding, not the best tool for studying migration because... You have to find them wherever they went. But at any rate, we've got 39 points elsewhere in Central and South America for purple martins that were banded in, in the breeding range in North America. So we can draw lines between those two things. And this is really kind of the first uh, study of purple martin migration. And even from just this little bit of data, um, you can see patterns, right? You can see that there are some that uh, that ended up in Central America and were found. And almost all of these uh, were were not found alive or were sick. So they were either dead or, or sick and injured. Um, and, and then a lot down in, in Brazil, right? But, you know, you can say for sure this bird started here and it ended up there. You don't know if it went there and it wasn't supposed to go there and that's why it died. Maybe it went to the wrong place. Maybe it's supposed to go to Europe or something and it instead went south so just finding them dead is not um good enough information it's a hint you know we thought well you could probably guess the purple martins are probably going to brazil right um but you can't get a whole lot and then there's the whole question that well these were dead or sick so maybe they were on their way somewhere else maybe they were on their way to the southern tip of south america maybe they're on the way to antarctica who knows but you know you can start to get some information from bird banding. It's primarily used for uh, other part, other types of data collection, um, but you can get some migration info from it. And then in the 80s, uh, a, a guy in Brazil did this. I'm just going to cut to this video. A identificação da Durinha Azul em São Paulo não foi feita por nenhum acadêmico ou cientista. 
O engenheiro químico e apaixonado por passarinhos, algas, bichos, ainda era menino quando abateu o mandurinha azul para o trabalho de pintura do pai. Nos anos 80, com a ajuda dos pesquisadores Dino Visor e Jack Viriá, constatou era mesmo a Progne Subs, a andorinha azul que vinha da América do Norte. Faltava confirmar a migração e a rota. Através da Associação de Preservação da Vida Selvagem, Dalgas conseguiu uma autorização do governo americano para a microetiquetação. Com tinta especial, pintou mais de 300 mil andorinhas em cinco cidades paulistas. Cada grupo recebeu uma cor diferente, só visível com luz ultravioleta. O trabalho em conjunto com sociedades andorinheiras do Canadá e Estados Unidos foi um sucesso. Com a pintura das andorinhas, dois meses depois, foram recuperados nos Estados Unidos e Canadá 32 aves, o que provou definitivamente que elas migram. Agora, com a recuperação das penas que elas perderam nos dormitórios durante a volta, foi possível descrever com exatidão a rota migratória deles. Pretty wild, right? So that guy named Dalgas Frisch was a uh, is a eccentric Brazilian millionaire, um, and somehow he pulled the right strings and got permission to basically spray paint entire flocks of purple martins, different colors for different flocks, UV dye on the feathers, and then launched a big uh, kind of. There was no published research papers from this, it, but obviously from the video, we know that it happened, and uh, there were some newspaper articles and that kind of thing. But, you know, an interesting uh, uh, side note in, in the Purple Martin migration research uh, book. All right, so now we're going to get into the cool stuff, the technology uh, how we've really gotten to where we are today. And when I say we moving forward, I mean both the Purple Martin Conservation Association and uh, a few research partners that were really integral in, in conducting this research and publishing it. Um, initially, Bridget Stutchbury at York, York University in Canada. Um, then uh, a grad student of hers, Kevin, Dr. Kevin Frazier, um, who was at York, and then he went on to uh, University of Manitoba, where he is now and uh, continues to conduct Purple Martin migratory research. And uh, the folks at Disney, um, both in conducting the research and writing, um, but also in, in helping to fund this type of research. So um, kind of our major partners there. And uh, technology is awesome. Um, about, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago now, um, we designed, and, uh, this device was designed uh, called a light level geolocator. Um, it looks like a little weird spy device or something, but basically it is a, a little battery, a little microchip to record, and then that little stalk that sticks out right there. And on the end of that stalk is a photo cell. And it's no different than the photo cell that's on your night light, the little automatic night light that turns on when the light turns off and it turns off when the light turns on. Basically, all that little thing does is it looks at light levels and records them throughout the day. Um, so that's why it's sticking up out of the feathers there. Um, and this type of technology finally got shrunk down far enough to, to go on a songbird uh, and be carried on migration. And it's heavily regulated, very strict, that you can't have any more than 3% of a bird's body weight as a burden for them to carry. Um, you know, so it was just a matter of time until battery technology and all the other circuitry got shrunk down and light enough to, to do. Um, and how this works, basically, it's just looking at light levels throughout the day, right? It's dark at night and gets a little brighter as morning comes and is bright during the day and then, you know, uh, goes on to night again. And we know that by the time of sunrise and sunset, you can tell how far east or west you are on the planet, right? because time zones, you know, the sun rises earlier in the East Coast than it does on the West Coast. So that timing of sunrise and sunset, you can get East and West. And from the length of day, you can get North and South because of the tilt, the tilt of the Earth's axis. 
Um, so, you know, in summer, days are longer as you get north. And in winter, days are shorter as you get north and vice versa. So um, basically, this is just recording light levels. And then the computer does the heavy lifting and calculates where this little device was throughout the year as it was recording data. And you can get rough location data. You can't get very specific location data. You can get it down to a couple of hundred kilometers radius on where the tag was. So we're not talking about fine scale stuff here, but we are talking about rough location data uh, from the, that we can put on a bird and, and record its migration for the first time. And uh, I've got a clip here from a documentary uh, movie called The Messenger, and it uh, has a segment in it covering kind of the first Purple Martins with these geolocators on them. And, and those were the first songbirds to ever do it. And they were done, they were tagged and retrieved right here at the PMCA headquarters, headquarters in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. So let me run this clip. Uh, the Messenger is a fantastic uh, documentary, really important. I suggest everybody watch it. I think it's only available on DVD. Um, I don't believe it's streaming anywhere, but uh, you can check it out if you Google uh, The Messenger. So, I mean, incredible to be a part of that first songbird to be tracked. Uh, incredible information from a Purple Martin for the first time. Um, so we had this cool new tool in our tool belt and uh you know we went about putting out as many of these tags as possible to gather as much data as possible um so each of those little stars is uh, a participant a partner in the project um some of the primary ones are labeled there university of manitoba where dr frazier is obviously uh pmca in pennsylvania and, and disney animal kingdom uh uh, great partners, but e each and every one of those stars is an important part of the research. And we continue to be able to to, to tell individual stories about birds like this. Uh, this uh, female here, you can see the little uh, geolocator sticking out of her uh, feathers in the back there um, from up in, in Alberta. And uh, on her migration south, just about a week and a half or so, made it to the Gulf. Jumped across about a month in the Yucatan, which we discovered is, is pretty typical uh, for the Purple Martins to have a little kind of Central American break uh, in the rainforest there um, after they've kind of gotten out of harm's way and farther south to where they don't need to worry about cold weather uh, causing starvation. And then uh, on, on to Brazil and uh, spent the entire uh, North American winter in Brazil, moving eastward slightly. And then when it was time to migrate back north, boy, just went after it a week. And it was already back at the Yucatan Peninsula, ready to jump across the Gulf. And just uh, two weeks after that, it was all the way back at its uh, breeding ground. So um, demonstration, just like Dr. Stutchbury said, that, that these birds, when they migrate north, they're just going on instinct. They're, they have no indication or no evidence on what the weather is going to be like when they get back north and climate change leading to more instability uh, in weather patterns uh, is really putting those northern populations at risk um, and increasingly so once farther south as we saw uh, with recent freezes um, farther south and into uh, the United States in uh, early winter or late winter. So a summary, uh, 263 days away from uh, the breeding grounds. These are tropical birds that just happened to summer vacation up in North America and breed, uh, traveled over 22,000 kilometers for the trip. Um, think of how far birds that live to four, five, six years old, how, how far they've traveled. It's amazing. The spring migration was only three weeks and average speed was uh, over 600 kilometers per day. Just amazing feats for these little birds um, and important information that we're gathering along the way. And when you put a lot of these tags together, a lot of the data from these tags, you start to see patterns. So this is just a bunch of tags that were put out uh, over the years and, and uh, at our headquarters in Erie, Pennsylvania. And you can see little bottlenecks where the paths converge. So right along the Gulf Coast, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, Central America, Panama, where things tend to funnel down. You know, you know that 
when you've got birds converging on one spot, the habitat there is going to be important to understand and to conserve because they're going there for a reason. They're converging there for a reason. So major changes to that will impact the birds. And technology marched on. You know, we ended up uh, having GPS technology become miniaturized enough and the, the increased battery capacity that's necessary to, to run GPS circuits uh, got shrunk down small enough to go on a Purple Martin. And Purple Martins were one of the first to wear GPS tags as well. And I mentioned that you get rough location to 200, 300 kilometers from a light level geolocator. Well, GPS tag, a GPS logger, will get you just a couple of meters. So you go from knowing, oh, this Purple Martin was in New Jersey, to knowing the exact tree in the exact backyard in the exact street in New Jersey where that Purple Martin was sitting. So you can go from understanding the speed of migration and general routes and you know general areas of importance to knowing fine scale habitat data. Are they landing in these trees? Are they landing in this wetland? Are they landing here? You know, you can you can understand exactly what they're doing with GPS technology. And the, the first of these tags, just like the first of the geolocators, that had a really small capacity. You could only get a certain number of locations before the battery is dead. Um, but even with that, we were able to find out amazing things. So this is the first paper that uh, we published with GPS uh, scale, fine scale habitat data. And each one of these different colored uh, dots and lines as an individual bird. So you can see there, you know, five, 10, 15 dots per bird before the battery died. Um, but even with that small amount of individual birds and small amount of points sampled, we saw some incredible things. You might notice a little pinwheel in the middle there or a couple other circles with multiple colors in the circle. Um, with just a few birds sampled and just a few points per bird, we had amazing overlap in where the birds were going in Brazil. And this is uh, an individual point down in Brazil here that had five of the six locations where we deployed tags from. All of those birds went to the same place in Brazil. So Texas, Minnesota, Ontario, uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, birds from all those different places went to the same teeny tiny little sand spit on a tributary of the Amazon River there that you can see in the top left picture. So all those different colored dots was the different purple Martin all on this little sand spit. And we were seeing other locations as well, not quite with as big a overlap, but multiple birds from different places, which, you know, it, even just having two birds out of that small sample size overlap is really uh, statistically improbable to just happen by chance. And if you've got birds from all over the place going to the same spot, you know, there's something pretty important right there. And you can assume statistically that there was a heck of a lot of purple martins on that little sand spit. So with that kind of information in hand from our fine scale data, uh, we went to Brazil. We had to see what this habitat was that they were using to see uh, what's going on on the ground. So off we went. Got our maps, hopped on a riverboat, headed up the Amazon. That's Jason Fisher, uh, one of Kevin Frazier's grad students, Amanda Shave there, and Dr. Frazier right there on the right side of the screen, myself behind the camera. Uh, and we steamed up the river off to one of the points where, actually several of the points that GPS indicated birds were the previous year. And we made landfall on one of these locations. I believe this island here that we're on, uh, on the Rio Negro River, which is one of the two main rivers that leads and fills the Amazon. Uh, I believe that was one of the Florida uh, Disney birds that, that had visited that the previous year. Made landfall. We searched that island up and down, looking for evidence that purple martins were roosting there at night. We didn't see any evidence. We knew they were there the year prior, but they weren't there now. And we continued to check a couple of different locations to no avail. Um, there's our boat, the Mamie Denise, uh, kind of looking down that shoreline. And this is uh, a satellite view of that island. 
Um, so there, the, the sand spit, uh, the little bit of trees. And one of the things we immediately uh, realized and learned when we were down there is, is how great the uh, water level difference between dry and wet season is in, in the Amazon. So that's during the dry season, sand's exposed. During the wet season, it's just the tip tops of trees that are sticking out. The water level from dry to wet season, 50, 60 foot difference, huge difference in the water levels in the Amazon. And uh, it's a very different habitat when it's like that versus when it's like that. So timing came into play. And also, maybe this seasonal flooding complete flooding of the islands is why the birds are selecting it, right? Maybe each year it's flooded out completely and completely wiped clean of ground predators. I don't know. We didn't know. Um, we did know that the width of the river is incredible. 14 miles wide. I mean, if you didn't know any better, you'd think you're on a lake and there's this little bitty island out in the middle that, that gets completely washed clean every year. And it seems like a pretty safe place to go, right? Um, but we were learning. That's not all we were there to do, though. There was a very famous purple martin roost in the city of Manaus, which is where we were basing our work out of. And it was famously documented in the BBC documentary, The Life of Birds. Here's a little clip. So all those of you who recognize that voice, that was the one and only David Attenborough. Uh, and uh, highly recommend watching that documentary. I think it's streaming on Netflix or something. Um, but it has a really nice segment on Purple Martins. Um, and uh, it's not only covering them in the, in the Amazon, but also back in North America. And for, the, for those of you who may uh, have been around for a while, you'll recognize some old PMCA members and PMCA employees in the background of some of those shots uh, back in North America. But um, uh, so, you know, our plan was to utilize this roost for hands-on research with Purple Martin, studying them down there. But when we got there, we tried and tried to get an answer about when we could go check out the Purple Martins, and we finally hear, ah, they're not here anymore. No, no more information than that. Just them purple martins out here. That's all. We thought, oh gosh, you know, what's going on? You know, obviously there was a big purple martin roost there, uh, and you know, maybe maybe they just didn't want environmental types sniffing around. You know, the green goes coming down. You know, worried about the environment, and uh, you know, to put it lightly, some parts of Brazil depending on who's in charge and where it is, are not real concerned about environmental regulation. So maybe they just didn't want somebody sniffing around their dirty refinery. Maybe they're just busy. They didn't want the hassle of babysitting some gringos. And maybe they did something sinister. You know, maybe they did something to the birds. We didn't know. But we had to find out. We needed to know. We came a long way. And if the birds were there, we were going to work on them a little harder to get permission, right? So we had to find out. Were the birds there or do we need to go find them? So uh, we convinced and hired a local boat guy to take us uh, at dark into the river, to an island across the river from this refinery so we could spy on it. Um, he was very confused as to why we wanted to do that and suspicious, rightfully so. It sounds like a pretty sketchy request, especially for some folks who don't really speak Portuguese. Uh, hence the, the notebook and paper for us to draw the island and everything. Um, but money talks and we were able to hire him. And uh, you know, down the river we went. That's a refinery on the hill there. And uh, you might notice the clouds are pretty dark. Well, the tropics are where we are. And along with the tropics goes tropical rain. And uh, at the end of the day, after a hot, humid day, it usually rains a lot. And of course it did. And uh, 
the boy, the sky just opened up. This is us beached on the island. We can't see anything across the river because it's raining so hard. Um, you know, we're hunched over with our binoculars looking underneath the tarp. And for the those of you who, with keen eyes, you may notice in that earlier shot of us driving down the river, there was some uh, military boats. Well, the, the refiner's right next to a military base. So picture, picture us making kind of suspicious requests, staking out this refinery right next to a military base. I was sure that we were going to end up in a Brazilian prison. You know, I couldn't believe what we were doing, but we had to do it. We had to find out, right? So, um, you know, we did it. it, it the skies cleared up right at sunset, and sure enough, the birds did not arrive. The birds were truly gone, and uh, we were going to have to try and find them. Luckily, we, there was one small scare as we were leaving, but we did not get arrested. Our Brazilian uh, criminal records are still clean. But went back home. No purple martin roosts to be found. So... We got to work. We formed the International Purple Martin Working Group with partners in North America and South America. Uh, we pulled all kinds of people in. Our weekly meetings look like the Brady Bunch. This is a small version of, of what the meetings usually are, um, but just great collaboration across the continent. And many of these people you may recognize from talks from yesterday and today. We published educational materials to say, hey, this is what a purple martin is. If you see a flock of purple martins, tell us. We launched a citizen science program to, to do just that, to, to find where the purple martin roosts might be um, all across Brazil. And uh, we continued to gather uh, GPS tag data. This is just a bunch of GPS tag data, uh, uh, data uh, tracks all overlapped here. But we continued to gather data. You know, we were going to find that roost. We knew from in North America here, when a purple martin roost disappears from one spot, it's usually just moved, right? They usually don't just disappear. It's usually just moving somewhere else. We went back down to Brazil in uh, 2018, I think. Um, yeah, this was the end of 2018. We searched rural Southern Brazil, where purple martins uh, famously used to roost in different locations. We looked in the rainforests. We looked in the town squares. We looked above the rainforests. No dice. Still no roost. We're getting closer, but still nothing. But on this trip, we had another goal as well. And that was to uh, establish the first two towers in the MODIS network in Brazil. So... Uh, you may have heard other talks about the MODIS network, but this is just a real quick video explaining what it is. The MODIS wildlife tracking system uses tiny tracking devices and a network of hundreds of receiving stations strategically located throughout the Western Hemisphere. MODIS is yielding spectacular discoveries. Now, researchers can safely track bird movements over vast distances and with incredible detail to pinpoint the greatest threats to vulnerable species. So that's the MODIS network. It's basically like a cell phone network for wildlife. Um, you know, like in uh, investigations, you hear the so-and-so cell phone pinged off this tower. So they were there at the murder scene, that kind of thing. Um, this is basically what that is. It, it, it's a, you put a little transmitter on an animal and it pings off antennas that it passes by. And why do we need to do that when we have these fancy GPS tags? Well, you need to know where the bird's going to be a year later to retrieve the GPS tag. It doesn't transmit the data. You have to gather it. You have to retrieve it from the bird. And if we're putting tags on animals at a roost in South America, we don't know where it's going to be. It could be in Florida. It could go to Maine. It could go to Alberta. Who knows where it's going? So the MODIS network is the best way to study uh, animals if, if you don't have a place where you can retrieve tags from. And here we are uh, installing one of those two towers here on a observation tower up above Bird the Rainforest. Uh, that's pretty amazing to do. And that's it on the left there from the top of that tower. And then the other one on the right there, uh, not too far from a river. 
uh, from the Rio Negro where we thought maybe there was going to be a roost. We might have just been there at the wrong time for, for it. Um, and we determined that partially from uh, GPS data from the previous year. Uh, there's a map of the MODIS uh, towers and our two little dots there in the middle of Brazil. I'm so proud of our little yellow dots. But we went back home again with multiple Martin roots to be found. We knew we were close. So upon departure, I said, well, as soon as you find that roost, I will be back. Uh, because we've got tags, we're ready to put, we're ready to do some research on the ground. And in February, we got uh, this message in the middle of the night. Holy bleep, we've seen it. It's much more spectacular than we imagined. I have no words. So, I'm a man of my word, hopped on a plane, went right back. And uh, the water was a little higher, and the islands were a little more flooded, and we headed off into the flooded forest to try and find this roost, because they had found it. And uh, this is kind of one of the first videos that we shot there. I'm sure you can't see it on Zoom, um, but so many birds, 300,000 more. Uh, you know, it's hard to count a lot of birds in the air, but our best estimate, uh, 300,000 range. Here's a picture with maybe a little better resolution uh, that might come across better on Zoom. So many birds. Um, and the thing about it, you, there's levels. You've got all these birds. The sky's full of them right down by the water level, by the top of these treetops. A little bit farther up, there's another level of purple martins, just as dense. And then you squint, you squint, you can just barely make out in the dark. There's little pepper flakes all up in the air. There's a bajillion purple martins up as far as you can see. Just insane amounts of purple martins at this roost. And, you know, like I said, this is during the high water. The... The island seems like just little shrubs, right? The the vegetation is not more than you know six, seven feet above water level, but really we're 40, 50 feet above the ground and it's just completely flooded. It's just the tops of those trees. There's Pamela with uh, maybe the first purple Martin that uh, got a tag deployed on it there. Uh, we were so excited uh, to be finally getting hands on purple Martins and doing research in the Amazon. All right, 2020, we went back. More research to be done. We're just scratching the surface. So we got some cool video this time. The island that we're going to, the name of it is Ilha de Kumaru. So we're about to see about 300,000 purple martins that are gathered here. They just finished spending North American winter all over the rainforest feeding and enjoying the, the numerous insects that a rainforest has. And they kind of get together here as a last uh, refueling spot before they make the migration north to, to North America where they nest uh, east of the Rocky Mountains from the Gulf all the way up to, uh, to parts of Canada. After they leave here, they'll be at their breeding grounds in about three weeks. They go, go, go. Some of these birds, uh, their migration is uh, up to 10,000 kilometers. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge physical feat. So when the birds finally dive in and you it creates a wind and the sound of just these birds flying by you at high speed in unison. It gives you goosebumps. It's, I can't describe how incredible it is. Um, that's from a video called 300,000 Purple Martins in the Amazon on a YouTube channel called Into the Unknown. I uh, highly recommend you guys look that up. Um, 
but that's not all. Uh, we had something pretty cool that happened uh, on this trip. We have color band in both. When I stuck my hand in the bag and grabbed this bird, and then I felt what felt like a band in my finger, and I thought, that can't be right. Maybe it's got a swollen leg or some kind of leg problem. This is, we did not expect this. This is about as good luck as we could possibly hope for. So guys, in 100 years, there have been a half million Purple Martins banded, and this is the first live capture of a banded Purple Martin in Brazil. We're experiencing a statistical anomaly. You want to bet on where it's from? OK. What do you want to bet? Say 50 push ups. I'm gonna say 50. Push I'm gonna say Connecticut. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the results are in. I've heard back from the bird banding laboratory. Middle of the Amazon, I got a signal. All right, the answer is Connecticut. Uh, oh. <laughs> Connecticut. So, when was it banded? July 10th, 2019. Incredible. Incredible. Guys, never bet with a bird biologist. <laughs> you gotta count them out. That was one. So now we're going back to release the birds back at the roost to where we pulled them from. Quite a development there, right? Um, for those of you wondering, I did hustle that poor fellow. Um, if you'll go back and watch the video tape, it was his idea to bet. I wasn't going to bet him because as soon as I knew what was on that bird's leg, I knew where it was from because it's my job to know. <laughs> um, but yeah, he learned a valuable lesson. And uh, yeah, we took this number from 39 to 40. So the 40th of banded birds recovered and I believe the first one alive uh, and re-released in the Amazon. 2021, there was no research done because of uh, COVID concerns, but during uh, the roosting uh, period in early 2022, the COVID levels were low enough to where we felt safe uh, conducting research and we went back. And uh, we got some more video. You guys concentrate on the sound for this. Hopefully it comes across clearly. It's one of those things I can tell you what it's like, but you have to be there. But the the sound and the wind that hits you when these birds all fly down in unison, uh, it gives you goosebumps every single time. Um, the most amazing thing, one of the most amazing things I've ever experienced. I had to correct that because of my kids and my wife and everything, but it's right up there. Pretty pretty incredible. Oh yeah, we we caught another banded bird. This year, um, I mean, I can't even begin to describe how improbable that was. Um, you know, to catch one during the previous 
expedition was amazing. Erica, uh, who is going to be presenting here soon, uh, this afternoon, she was convinced we were going to catch another one. And I was telling her, you're crazy. The odds of that happening have got to be so low. And sure enough, we reached in a bag and we pulled out a bandit bird. And this one was also from Connecticut. I mean, just, I, I don't even know. I mean, just always something wild, always an adventure, uh, always something wonderful that we've learned. Um, we've got so much research that we've um, launched. And, uh, oh yeah, 41. But we, we've started so much new research uh, with our partners down there. Um, so much to come. I, I wish research didn't take so long to work its way through to publication, but it takes time. And uh, we're just scratching the surface on what's possible. Um, you're going to hear about some of it today. Uh, but just, you know, we can't do any of it without the support of our members, donations, memberships, um, the support of our research collaborators. Uh, the public, uh, everyday landlords, each one of the birds came from your backyards. Um, just thank you guys so much. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to uh, you know, do this research on Purple Martins and know that every single thing that we do is to better understand the conservation risks that Purple Martins are facing so we can make uh, better conservation recommendations to save these birds. Um, what we want to do is ensure the future of Purple Martins, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Bye. All right. Uh, <laughs> John. Um, question about uh, uh, radar from Tim. Um, definitely not a stupid question. Doppler radar towers near the Amazon basin for finding roosts. There is radar there. I'm not sure what technology it is, if it's Doppler or the old school kind of basic radar, uh, but it's more associated with uh, uh, the military and the airport in Manaus. As you get farther out from Manaus, there's really no radar coverage that I know of. And then the next problem is accessing that data. We have a real hard time getting in touch and getting communication back. Communication is a real difficult thing to to get reliably with folks in Brazil. Uh, but we don't even know if they're saving that data or if it's just, you know, they look at the radar and then it's gone because it takes huge amounts of data to save radar uh, uh, um, uh, scans. It fills up. It's just like in a high definition video. It takes up oodles of oodles of space. So um, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. But uh, I don't know if you guys were here yesterday when Maria uh, uh, was talking about uh, purple martin roosts and radar. Um, but she's uh, Brazilian, and we have all, all of our contacts in Brazil that we're uh, you know going to be mobilizing to try and get that. Uh, Kathy asks, uh, at Roos, how do you capture the Martins, um, mist nets? No, actually, uh, the, the vegetation that they're in is so low to the water surface that we just take our canoes up there and cut the engine and coast in and paddle up and we just pick them off the trees like apples and stick them in bags. <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, you know, purple Martins. It seems like at least uh, at that roost in Brazil, they're as easy to study as they are up here, uh, up north. So, uh, who owns the tower where the MODIS was installed? You're talking about that big observation tower. Um, I don't know exactly who owns that property, but it's at the uh, it's at Musa, which is the Museum of Science in the Amazon, or something along those lines. It's if you ever look at a uh satellite view of manaus there's like a very obvious square that stands out of green and it's a huge uh area that's protected with virgin rainforest in and the the city is like kind of encroaching around it but that is actually being protected and it's it's within that stand of uh uh of virgin uh rainforest 
da, 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 da. Thank you to everybody who's saying lovely things. How many Martins were able to hand grab at the roost? Uh, James Hill asked. Um, we tend to get about a hundred per visit. Well, this last trip uh, in the beginning of this year, we had uh, maybe like a hundred and ten uh, purple Martins and other species. Uh, there are some other ones that are on on the roost there as well that that share uh kind of that roosting location um but majority of purple martins i think we got a hundred purple martins and then a handful of others and in years past it's been more around 50 maybe i don't know 30 to 50 um, but we really went with the mission this year to get a hundred purple martins for uh several of the different studies but um what we really wanted a hundred for this time was for the uh, virus surveillance study that I think Erica may be speaking on in a little bit. Da, 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 da. When are you taking us to Brazil? Man, I wish I could bring everybody. Uh, did I mention that there is a big surprise later uh, at the end of the uh, Brazil session? One time. Yeah, uh, Erica, the, the other one the other tower, the receiver station that's closer to the roost is that private property of Mario uh, Conehaft that is uh, speaking today uh, in a little bit. Yeah, Lori, I can't believe that we had two Connecticut Purple Martins in two consecutive years that we just reached, we happened to grab. It's uh, clearly when we're there is when those Connecticut Martins are migrating through. Um, Erica with the link to uh, Museum of the Amazon. That's what I, th I thought it was something like that. Um, do you, Tim asks, can you, do you think I could sit in near a roost in Iowa cornfield without disturbing the roost significantly? How close would you recommend? Great question. Um, well, in that clip with David Attenborough, he clearly must have been parked there for a while because the birds were all around him. So I guess it's conceivably possible. You know, it's up to you if you want to risk disturbing the birds. Eventually, you're going to have to leave unless you're going to sit there motionless until morning. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you can get fairly close if you're if you're uh, stationary. I mean, you see uh, in videos of the roost down in uh, uh, the southern states, you know, that are in malls and stuff. People are practically under the trees that they're roosting in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Terry wants to ask, uh, how far from the roost is Manaus refinery? Um, great question. I am not entirely sure it, it's, it's miles, but not hundreds of miles. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's on the way up. Um, Madeline asks, what kind of data are you gathering from each bird? Um, you're going to hear about some of that in the next session, uh, about some of the different studies with samples that, that were taken, but you know, we did the obvious, you know, body measurements, looking at uh, uh, their condition, the, the how far through molt they are. Um, we uh, uh, take feather samples. We're going to hear about. Uh, we're doing swabs for uh, virological surveillance. Um, uh, we put tags on them. Obviously, they get banded. Um, that sort of thing. Did the Amazon tag birds? have distinctive colors if they show up at someone's site. Um, they're only a silver band, so they probably wouldn't stand out that much. That's just the way they are, the ones that we've got. Um, however, after, I don't know if it was the first or second trip, I think, it, I don't remember which one, uh, but not long after I returned here to Erie, one of those birds showed up uh, in, oh gosh, uh, the Midwest somewhere, Kentucky, maybe, um, it had actually, it was stuck in the cold, uh, in a cold, uh, spring. So it was actually sitting on a, a road on the pavement to warm up and it got hit by a car, but it actually had one of the most tags on its back. Uh, and that's the only reason that, that they noticed to call us. So, uh, other people may be seeing them and not realizing it. Erica listing uh, a lot of the, uh, yeah, hormones and contaminants. Um, we're going to hear about that. Mario says about 20 miles from the refinery. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's crazy that 
something that close would be hard to find, right? You'd think you would know that, but have I mentioned communication is an issue in Brazil? And as soon as you leave Manaus, it's very, very remote. Um, not a lot of traffic, uh, uh, transportation's difficult. Um, and, you know, folks, you know, they don't know that you're looking for something unless word makes it to them that you're looking for something. So uh, through a combination of kind of collecting citizen science data and gathering more GPS tag data and um, uh, just getting the word out uh, to locals, th that all works together to, to bring it back. Um, Erica says they have silver tags that say INPA, I-N-P-A, and it has a number, a unique number on it. Um, how many times have you been to Brazil? Have you got a camp set up there? Um, you may have seen in the background of some of those uh, videos towards the end there, there's like a, it's like a weird little floating platform thing. So, you know, those flooded forest communities uh, that spend, you know, over half of the year fully submerged, um, they rely a lot on like floating houses and floating docks that they operate out of. And then obviously houses on stilts as you get closer to shore to where that's possible. Um, so we actually uh, uh, work with some locals there and use their little floating platform. So it's just like an open air floating dock out in the river um, that we just sleep in hammocks and, and then work. <laughs> Terry's got her hand up. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, Terry, uh, you, so you're unable to chat? I'm sorry. Figure I'd know if you can't chat. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, she's good. Sorry. Um, that must have been from earlier. Uh, Jean asks, Perhaps I missed this earlier, but do you think the birds fly in mass to Brazil roost or they come in small flocks or numbers? Um, to that roost, you know, that seems to be maybe the last, you know, that roosting behavior seems to kick in right before they migrate, just like it does up here in the north. So kind of get together, then migrate down there, all over the place, get together, then migrate. Um, and, and it seems like there's just kind of a, a slow kind of aggregation of martins um but certainly at night when they come in to, to roost they're in mass uh, obviously uh <clears throat> larry says uh, he's trying to find a roost one year and a security guard said he saw birds by what sounded like a waterfall it was the sound of all the birds that had landed making the sound yeah it's uh yeah you have to decipher clues when asking non-birders yeah, so the, the sounds, I mean, with that many birds all at once, it's just like a, you know, it's a, it's just like a, a roar, white noise sound. And uh, obviously, the when they fly, it's uh, making its own sound. How's the Brazilian government to work with? <laughs> uh, luckily, I haven't had to work directly with them. It's been our partners that, that have worked with them. Uh, but but working with uh, uh, you know large groups, uh, large organizations, and governmental organizations is a challenge sometimes in Brazil. Let's say that. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in for this. We're going to jump straight over into the other session. Thank you for indulging me and in letting this session go fifteen minutes long. <clears throat> 